Um, without further ado, welcome everyone. Uh, this is our, Jesus, maybe fourth webinar now in our Startup Toolbox webinar series, which is a series of webinars from our experts, from the Register of Experts, from our mentoring and coaching network, put together and um, put together for subjects that a lot of our startups have been, you know, inquiring about, a lot of um, subjects that our mentors think are really useful for startups to know about. Today, we welcome our wonderful uh, Bob Mullen to give us a talk about corporate startup relationships. So just to give you a little bit of background about um, Bob, Bob is a mentor here with us at EIT Health. He also mentors with other programs like Techstars. So he knows a lot about startups and backgrounds and how to get you where, to where you need. He is actually a lawyer, a corporate lawyer by training. He specializes in m and um, in corporate and securities. And we're quite lucky that he um, crossed the Atlantic to help early stage and growth startups with everything US related. So he helps our startups with everything from commercialization in the US to regulatory affairs and how to find US investors. So today he's going to talk to us a bit more about corporate startup relationships. We invite everyone who's here today to use the Q&A function to ask questions as we go along. There's also going to be a poll at one point which we would love for you to interact with. So um, I'll stop talking because I'm sure no one wants to hear this croaky voice and I'll pass over to Rob. Hi, Alan. thanks very much. I, I appreciate it. Um, is my screen currently being shared or not? I've just made you host, so you're more than welcome oh. to take it away. Okay. Um, first of all, thanks everybody for coming. Um, this, this program came out of a, a problem that I've seen um, over the years I've been mentoring, which was uh, lots of startups who were expecting uh, corporates um, that they were talking to uh, to do things um, that they were never going to do or never going to be able to do in a time frame that uh, was going to make sense for the startup. And I've actually seen a few uh, startups fail as a result while waiting around for corporates to do stuff. So this program could easily be called um, corporate uh, startup non-collaboration where they don't work for startups. Um, and it was in that context, I was thinking particularly about um, uh, a particular a, a song I've been listening to recently by a rather obscure Scottish rock group called uh, Biffy Clyro. Um, look them up, they're, they're, a great, they're a great group even though they're not well known. Um, but this particular song um, is a song called uh, End Up. Uh, and I think it really encapsulates what we're talking about here. So this is, this is the quote from the song. Um, uh, and I think it, it, it perfectly encapsulates um, kind of what I think is the key issue here, which is um, that corporates really actually, most corporates really don't know how to collaborate um, with startups. Uh, and there are, I think, um, three takeaways, if you don't take away anything else from this presentation that, um, that I'd like you to, to, to keep in mind. One is I think many corporates, large corporates incumbents don't know how to collaborate full stop, um, um, uh, even with other big corporates. They may be able to use um, contractors and big firms like uh, Accenture to do stuff for them or buy stuff, but they actually are not structured to collaborate at all and therefore um, uh, it's hopeless to think that they will be able to collaborate with you. Um, uh, the, the second point is simply that if a corporate hasn't itself figured out how to do intrapreneurship, in other words, if it hasn't figured out how to support its own people in developing innovation, and I'm not talking about process improvement, I'm talking about true innovation, it is highly unlikely that they're going to be able to collaborate with you uh, in the context of innovation. Um, and therefore, the third point is that when you are uh, trying to figure out who your targets are, <clears throat> it's important um, to keep in mind not whether you think there is strategic alignment, but whether that corporate has actually shown any ability uh, to be able to uh, collaborate with startups. Um, and I think we'll come back to this in more detail, but, but that's really, for me, is the kind of uh, starting point of the discussion today which is they just don't know how. Uh, they are ill-prepared effectively to collaborate. Um, there are, uh, by the way, these slides violate all the rules of slides. So if you're doing pitch decks, uh, please don't do what I've done um, and put um, uh, as much text as you will see on these slides. I, I 
review pitch decks all the time and tell people not to do this. Um, but the reason I put a lot of text on the slides is I am going to provide them to, to uh, Alla and Rosemary uh, uh, to circulate to anyone who wants them. And I think to some extent, they are a useful um, a memoir about some of the points that we're going to talk about today. So what I really, the, the specific topics are the ones which are shown here, which is why collaborate in the first place? What's required for successful collaboration? Why do they frequently fail? What you as a startup need to do better in order to get to a successful collaboration? All of those issues, frankly, rely are not specific to health tech, med tech, life sciences, but there are some special issues in the med tech and health tech space. Um, and I will want to talk about that um, and about what makes collaboration works and, and how they should be documented. Now, assuming I can manage this, I'd like to share a poll and just get a sense of the extent to which the people on the, on the other side have either had a successful collaboration or have had an unsuccessful collaboration, either with a large corporate or another large customer. Okay, I think I've probably allowed enough time for people to vote. Um, here's sort of the, um, the results that have come through. Um, and um, one of the things I certainly will welcome as we go along in terms of the discussion Q&A is both um, in the context of people who have had a successful collaboration, things which maybe I'm missing that they think have worked, and for those in particular who've had an unsuccessful collaboration, which I gather is, is something like 38% of the people who've responded, um, it'd be interesting to know whether they think I've missed anything in, in that respect as well as for what caused things to fail. Um, so when I'm talking about collaboration here, I'm using, I'm using it in a broad sense, which is not just kind of um, uh, proof of concepts and challenges and things of that sort, but also um, as broad as uh, JVs or joint development and sales and normal commercial uh, transactions. So basically any kind of interaction that you have with a large corporate um, uh, as a startup. Um, but particularly focused on, on the kind of more in-depth collaborations, the ones that, that uh, are, are, are more beyond the kind of just the sale of a product. Um, a key starting point, I think, in thinking about any collaboration is really understanding what's in it for you and what's in it for them. Um, uh, and making sure that there is a complete alignment of objectives um, that's complicated, it sounds simple, but on the corporate side, you actually have to think very much about whose objectives that we're, you're talking about. Um, um, because these are lots of people in lots of different, wearing lots of different hats. And as we'll talk about uh, shortly, if you don't have the right people with the right hats uh, supporting uh, the collaboration, it's going to fail. Um, and so understanding uh, who's on board, whose objectives are being met by, by the discussion is critical. It's very easy for somebody in an innovation group to be very excited about what you're doing um, and get you very excited about the relationship with that company, but that person may actually have very little ability um, uh, to get stuff done in the company. Um, and uh, while their objectives may be to kind of find interesting stuff and promote it to their senior management, that doesn't necessarily accomplish your objective of actually getting a deal done. Um, there really need to be real needs on both sides. Um, uh, if you start out in a context where you are providing something that would be a nice to have for the corporate, but doesn't actually meet a key strategic objective of theirs or solve a real problem, a real pain point, the likelihood is it's not going to go anywhere. Okay, you may get a POC, you may do a challenge, but it's not actually going to yield any kind of result that's going to make sense for you. Um, and in some ways, uh, it can be negative. If you wind up doing a POC and that is not a proof of concept or a trial, and that isn't followed by a contract, first of all, you've wasted a lot of resource in doing it. But second of all, also, um, you may have to explain why to others, to potential corporate clients or others, to investors, why that didn't actually result in a commercial contract. So I think you need to be very focused 
in making sure, particularly with trials and proof of concepts, that there is um, a real expectation that a commercial arrangement is gonna follow and to, for you to understand why you can reasonably have that expectation. So a lot of this is, is due diligence on your side to understand why this is all important to the corporate. Um, a starting point is this point of commitment and transparency. Um, uh, I talk about evidence of commitments of being pigs and not chickens. There is this old story about the difference between um, a, a pig and a chicken in respect of, of breakfast, um, which is that the, the chicken is interested, uh, but the pig is committed. Um, uh, and this story was told to, was reminded to me by uh, an innovation guy at a large corporate who basically said, look, every time I have a project, lots of people show up at that initial meeting and we sit around the table and he said, and I don't know if this is true, but he says, I go around and I say, you're a pig and you're a chicken, okay? You are um, actually going to be committed to doing this. You're interested in it. And he says, and I don't let the, I don't let the chickens talk. Um, and he says, after a while, the chickens actually stop coming and the people who are attending those meetings are the people who actually are required to get what's, uh, uh, what needs to be done done. So understanding at the corporate side, who is committed to your project is critical because if you don't have the right people aligned, it's not gonna go anywhere no matter what level of enthusiasm uh, you're seeing. Um, the, the next point here is really to understand what requirements are, are gonna uh, need to be satisfied in order to do the project. Um, what parts of the corporate need to actually produce things um, in order for you to be able to um, uh, achieve your objective? Do you need support from IT? Do you need support from procurement? Do you need support from legal? Uh, what parts of the business need to be engaged? And are, are all of those engaged? Do they have the resources? And what's the timing? Um, are you a high priority in what they're doing? Are you something that they do after they do the other seven tasks? And is there senior commitment effectively at the corporate level to make sure that you are not at the bottom of the list? So kind of understanding the internal processes of a corporate, um, what the internal reporting and approval and operational processes are um, is, really, is really significant. I suspect at least some of the people on the call probably have been in a large corporate um, and, they, and they understand this, but a lot of at least the first time entrepreneurs that I see who maybe have been entrepreneurs really don't entirely understand, I think, how the sausage is made in these corporates and the and the different uh, politics and other factors which go into deciding which things get moved along and which things don't. Um, I think the other thing from uh, your standpoint to understand about the corporate is what is their actual experience in terms of collaboration, both collaboration with large corporates and even more important collaboration with startups. Because if you're the first one, it's not gonna happen. Or if it does happen, it's not likely to happen in a time frame that is um, going to be important to you. Um, and then these final two points I hope are, are, are clear, but there needs to be a clear commitment at the beginning. First of all, is what is success? Okay, what will you have to deliver in order for, for, order for the corporate to um, agree that the trial or, or, or the collaboration has been successful? And what is the at least moral commitment on their side as to what's supposed to happen if the trial succeeds and who is that commitment coming from? Um, uh, because again, it's very easy to do a trial. Corporates do lots of trials, they do lots of challenges. Uh, it helps them to kind of see what's going on in the market. Um, but it's not very useful to you if there isn't um, uh, a contract that's gonna result from that. Now, ideally, you know, you would have a setup that basically said, okay, if we achieve these three objectives, then automatically that flips into a contract. Um, I find, however, many times that just isn't practicable, but that at least you should be trying to get some kind of moral commitment and understanding as to what's supposed to happen if the trial is successful. Um, a lot of the problems with corporate startup collaborations are a complete mismatch between um, understandings, expectations on both sides. Um, um, the, the cultures are very different and therefore um, uh, getting, getting things aligned is, is a lot more complicated than for example, if you were a large corporate trying to do um, a collaboration with another large corporate. Um, from a startup side, there's a real issue of culture clash. 
which is um, startups frequently, as I referred to before, don't really understand the way that the corporate works in terms of the fact that there are multiple stakeholders, there is an awful lot of politics which is going on, um, and there's a need for a senior commitment. The second thing that startups don't, I think, understand is that failure is a big deal in most corporates. Okay, there are the few corporates like Amazon where effectively failure is understood as part of the process and the concern is to make sure that you fail early um, and that you learn from the failure. But in most more traditional corporates, failure is a really bad thing for the person who is the advocate um, uh, and potentially for the corporate itself. Uh, lots of times failures in, in corporate innovations take place too late. Um, budget keeps getting spent on things which clearly are not going to succeed. Um, uh, but in any case, for the person who is um, responsible for the particular project, um, that could be career ending at that corporate. And the startup needs to understand that that, that, that is the, those are the stakes that may be applicable for, for the person on the other side. Um, legacy systems is a big issue. Um, um, a lot of large corporates have particularly, for example, IT systems that are held together with bailing wire um, and run by people in their 60s who are the only ones who still understand it because they were in their 30s when they started working with those systems. And God only knows what will happen to those corporates when those people retire. Um, so part of the process that the startup is having to deal with is how to deal with the impact of the legacy system. Uh, can one avoid integration or effectively take whatever data that you may need from that system? But the whole issue of understanding how to deal with, with the legacy operations is part of your due diligence. Um, you should not expect the same level of entrepreneurial spirit uh, in a large corporate that, that you're accustomed to. Um, there is a not invented here syndrome. There's also generally a, a safety syndrome, which is um, uh, I, I was involved in a case involving a, a company which startup, which had a really interesting innovation, which they presented to a utility for a very long time um, with a lot of support from senior management and from the innovation group. And at some point it got turned over to, uh, to the IT department um, and the IT department basically said, we don't want to do work with the startup. We'll go out and find Accenture or somebody like that to do this. And that was sort of the end of that collaboration. So one needs to have that sensitivity to the fact that the, that the corporate doesn't start from the same place as you do in terms of um, necessarily looking for a collaboration uh, with the startup. Uh, and for that, one simply needs to understand that, that, that uh, particularly a lot of traditional corporates just are not used to collaborating with startups and frankly don't like to do so. Um, Corporates have very complex and slow, uh, slow decision-making processes. There are lots of people who have the ability either to say no, or frankly, more likely than to say no, to just sit on stuff for extended periods of time. And so things that you expect are going to happen in, in reasonably quick time uh, wind up taking forever because there's nobody who is basically pressing that particular individual to, to move something off their desk. Um, you should not underestimate in the corporate the impact of incentive structures, okay? If I get a bonus that's based on doing A, B, C, D, and E, and you are F, you know, the likelihood that I'm going to be paying a lot of attention to getting your thing done um, is, is pretty slim. And likewise, if my promotion is based on A, B, C, D, and E, and you're F, it's the same issue. So part of the due diligence process from your under standpoint is understanding whether the people who are responsible for your projects actually have any incentive to get them done. Um, many large corporates are public companies. Um, they're therefore driven by uh, short-term uh, perspectives. Uh, in the U.S., is, we have quarterly reporting here. It's in the U.K., it's semi-annual. Um, and therefore, getting, say, quarterly numbers may be a much more important than issue than figuring out whether the corporation is going to be in the right place in five years. Um, and then the final point on this list, I think is really critical and I've seen it trip up startups time after time, which is people change and move on and priorities change and move on. Um, if your key advocate um, changes jobs, 
halfway through your project and you have to start again and find other people to replace that person, um, assuming that, they, that there are people to replace them, that can be highly uh, disruptive. Uh, the corporate itself can change its priorities and all of a sudden it's no longer that interested in what you're doing. So um, getting some level of depth within the organization uh, so that there is more, while there clearly will be a lead on your project, making sure that you also have relationships with other people uh, in the corporate who are um, responsible for getting it done helps to provide as much protection as you can against particularly the changes of personnel. Okay, uh, people in corporate jobs quite frequently change every two to three years. Um, and, and it's not uncommon uh, that the person you start off dealing with is not going to be there uh, by the time your deal is actually ready to get done. There are also things that the corporate hates about you um, um, and don't understand about you. One is they don't understand that you need cash, okay? Their time frame is on a different time frame. And the fact that things have to get done quickly because you are cash limited um, is not something that they're likely to understand. Um, and more generally, they're not, they're not likely to understand the fact that you are used to fast decision-making and need fast decision-making. Um, they don't understand that your teams are small and resource constrained. If they're, if they're used to working with large corporates, it, it doesn't occur to them that, that um, you know, there may be only a couple of people on your side who are getting things done. Um, they're not used to working in the way that startups work in terms of things like Agile and, and Lean Startup. Um, they don't like the fact that you don't understand them, that you are naive about, um, about how they operate. Um, there is sometimes a feeling on the corporate side that the startup uh, uh, people um, uh, don't really respect um, the senior management and the people, uh, uh, the, the senior people within the corporate, and that there's a level of informality which um, is not consistent with the way the corporate thinks that business should be done. Um, there's sometimes also a problem with startups of, of what I would describe as hype, um, which is a overselling um, uh, what you're doing, um, underestimating the complexity of scaling that or delivering it in the corporate context. Um, and just also, I mean, more generally, just a kind of level of superficiality and lack of humility. Um, and then this final point is, is, not an in, is not an unimportant point, which is any corporate who's dealing with you and in particular the lead people who are dealing with you have to worry about the fact that you may run out of money and may not be around in six months. And the project may fail for that reason. And they may be held responsible for its failure as a result. So, you know, they will start off with a certain risk averseness uh, in terms of uh, dealing with uh, you as a startup. Um, there's not a lot that you can do to manage that, um, but you just need to be uh, sensitive to it, and as a practical matter, understand that if you aren't dealing aren't addressing dealing with something which is truly uh, special, um, that you are not necessarily their preferred partner. Okay, so having now gone through the horribles on both sides, um, what do I think that startups can do better to try to address these things? One is. I think you really need to know your counterparty, not just at the beginning, but continue to get a lot of intelligence about what's going on in the corporate. Um, and it's not hard to get that. A, a lot of it's available from public sources, but also you're gonna be talking to people. Um, and, and, and a key part of this is really um, uh, listening uh, and asking questions uh, and getting information and making sure that if there seem to be changes of priorities, um, that you're learning about them. So a lot of it is, 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 is communication uh, and a question of, of listening. Um, listening is frequently an issue for startups because I think there's a tendency to go out and try to sell what you've developed. Um, uh, uh, and um, you know, you're proud of your product, you're proud of your service, um, and you're looking to sell it when in fact, what you need to do first as any kind of professional salesperson is focus on what their needs are and understand why they're interested um, uh, and how you might be able to help solve their problem as opposed to selling your product or your service. 
Um, and in the context of that, you're asking a bunch of questions and you have to listen very carefully to the answers you're getting because sometimes um, they may be a bit superficial. There may be a lot of enthusiasm which is being uh, shown, um, but which isn't necessarily indicative of a real commitment to, um, uh, to want to do something with you. And then finally on this list here is just a reprise of what I said before, which is you need to understand the constraints under which they're operating. Um, uh, who are you talking to? Um, uh, is the business uh, engaged um, in what you're doing? Is senior management supportive of what you're doing? Um, what level of commitment uh, is likely to be available from other parts of the, of, the, of the company that need to support your activity and is that commitment there? Um, that leads into kind of a more general and I think critical point um, which I think start, startups frequently fail at because they focus on their enthusiasm with what they see as a strategic fit with the corporate and the stuff they think they can bring, but they're not actually doing enough due diligence on the corporate itself. Um, uh, the first point of these is something which I said at the really beginning, which is you need to understand whether the startup itself, sorry, whether the corporate has a history of successful collaborations with startups. Um, that's a question you can ask. You should listen carefully to the answer that you're getting. Um, uh, I was involved um, not very long ago with a corporate that wanted to do something with the startup. And I could tell that there was actually no way that they would ever be able to do it. Um, um, they were not set up to do it. They had no experience in doing it. Um, there were clear um, uh, obstacles internally to the corporate uh, doing the collaboration. Um, uh, it was going to be a loser for any startup to try to get involved in a collaboration with that corporate. Um, and uh, you can get that intelligence. It's not hard to ask the, the corporate kind of, okay, so you're interested in this. You know, have you, have you been able to do collaborations like this before? What's worked? What hasn't worked? What could we do better to make sure that it works? You know, these questions can be posed in a way that are not um, aggressive. Um, uh, and seem to be helpful, but basically deliver to you the intelligence that you need. Um, the second point is again, the point I made at the beginning, which is if the corporate doesn't have an internal innovation culture of its own, the likelihood that it's going to actually be able to successfully collaborate with you is pretty slim. Um, and then the final point is understanding who are the people um, who have the ability to block what you're doing and what level of commitment do they seem to have uh, to, uh, to, to what you're doing. Um, I should have really been asking, and I will maybe stop at this point to ask if there are any questions um, that that I should be addressing before we before we move on. Um, I haven't seen anything sort of pop up in, in the Q and A, uh, but do but do feel free to uh, uh, to, uh, to, to, to to raise a question. Um, I think additionally, the, the startups need to be very realistic about what their ability is to deliver. Uh, the question that's come in is basically, how do you find the internal champion or advocate and know his or her true commitment? Um, I think a lot of the times the internal advocate is going to be somebody in an innovation group. Um, um, uh, and so, they will identify themselves to you rather than the reverse. Um, sometimes they will be people in the business. Um, uh, I usually find that the best internal advocates um, are incoming. So if you can reach a point where you're not actually having to go out uh, and sell, but where you're getting inquiries um, either through your website, through blogs, or whatever your uh, whatever materials you are putting up to try to attract interest, um, you are more likely to find both successful collaborations, but also um, the appropriate lead. Um, and I, in terms of assessing a lead, I think it's, again, it's really a question of diligence. Um, uh, most people, if you ask them a direct question, uh, like, you know, what, what pain point am I solving here for the business? Does the business recognize that as a pain point? 
you know, if you ask those kinds of questions, it's very hard, and you can ask them in an unaggressive way, it's very hard to avoid them. Um, uh, so I'm not sure that's a fully responsive uh, answer to the question, but in my experience, it isn't usually so much a problem of finding that advocate, because quite frequently through whatever contacts you wind up having with the corporate, the advocate finds you. Um, it's more a question of actually understanding what the position of the advocate is within that corporate and whether they actually have the support that they need, um, both from senior management, from the business, et cetera, to, to get things done. Um, you should understand the corporate innovation groups operate in lots of different models. Um, some of them are very close to the business um, and are going out and actually finding things that the business wants and wants to solve. Some of them are out sort of scouting for neat stuff um, because they have uh, somebody back at the corporate who maybe somebody in senior management who's just interested in knowing what's going on um, uh, kind of at the cutting edge. Um, some of them are corporate venture capital units, which again, might, might either be very close to the business and going out to try to invest in things which solve a specific problem for the business or may actually be quite far afield, almost functioning like a regular VC. So all this is part of the diligence, but usually it's a question not so much of uh, identifying who that lead is, but understanding whether that lead actually has the capacity to get something done for you. Um, in terms of what startups can do better uh, uh, further, I think there sometimes is a real lack of realism about what the startup has the ability to deliver at scale and communicate clearly. Um, um, uh, you need to be very um, honest about your own assessment of that. Um, the second point is you need to also be sensitive to what a corporate is likely to entrust to a startup, okay? They're not gonna entrust you with a key function by and large. They're, they're not gonna trust a startup to come in and take over a critical function of the corporate. Um, and so the question is, is whether you can provide something which is helpful, addresses a pain point, um, and um, uh, gets you in initially um, to that corporate with the view that if that works out, that they may then trust you to do something more. So one of the things I sort of have learned over the time period that I've been doing this, and it, it, it took me a while, is the benefit of modularity, which is um, I had so many startups at the beginning who were coming in with what I would describe as all singing, all dancing solutions um, and finding it very hard to get large corporates to pay any attention to those solutions. If you break that down into modules, such that you can offer a module that does X or Y that addresses a specific pain point and you do that successfully. The corporate may then trust you to try another module that addresses another pain point. And over time you get um, uh, a relationship with the corporate and you may ultimately be able to sell the whole solution, but you're not likely to be able to sell a broad based solution going in at the beginning. A um, Couple of other questions which have come in. Um, and let me address them. The first was from, from Lars who basically says, um, are the points relevant to collaboration the same as for an acquisition? And I assume you mean an acquisition of a startup. Um, I think it depends upon what your objectives are. Um, in most cases, when I see startups acquired, um, the founders are typically, typically gone within a year. Um, and uh, or after a year, they may have some kind of lock-in, um, but they are, um, uh, it is unusual for somebody who's used to operating as an entrepreneur in a startup to be comfortable um, in a large corporate uh, operating a subsidiary. I think there are some large corporates who've learned how to do this better, particularly in the tech sector, but in general, for that reason, um, it really depends upon your, what your objectives are. If your objective is to, is to stay with the corporate and to build something, I think a lot of the questions are the same questions, but you also need to understand you're gonna be operating in a very different environment from the one that you've been accustomed to. If your objective is an exit, um, um, I think there are probably two things. One is obviously the, the consideration. And I think the second point is 
uh, understanding what you're getting up front versus what you may be uh, purporting to be getting as an earnout um, uh, uh, for effectively for staying on and showing additional um, uh, performance. Uh, my advice to you is to get as much as you can up front uh, and not rely on being able to get the earnout. There are so many things that, that can happen in a corporate that can mean that they will not deliver what they need to deliver in order for you to do what you need to do. Um, and so if you're if you're looking at an acquisition in the context of uh, uh, of something where you you should recognize it's probably an exit um, and, and and approach it in that way. Um, the next, the other question that came up that's come up from from Javier is a question of whether uh, it's advisable to have multiple negotiations in parallel. Um, I think the answer generally is is yes, depending upon what you mean by negotiation. Um, um, uh, it is dangerous to put all of your eggs in a single basket. Um, and um, uh, I've certainly seen situations where, where um, startups have relied too much on a particular transaction getting done and therefore have been damaged when it hasn't gotten done. Um, that being said, when you get to a certain stage in dealing with a pipeline, of the level of commitment that's required effectively to continue to keep that a lot of discussion increases. And it's for that reason in particular that, that the diligence that I was talking about is really important because a key part of what you are doing is triaging that pipeline and making a judgment as to what transactions, uh, what collaborations are more likely to get done. That doesn't mean you're gonna ignore the others. Uh, you'll try to do enough to keep them warm, but you need to, effectively concentrate your efforts on the ones that you think are more likely to happen in a reasonable time frame. And for a startup um, with limited resource, that's probably only going to be a few at a time. Uh, hopefully that's that's responsive, but but uh, 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 feel free to uh, to come back um, if uh, if there's more on that if there's more on that point. Um, Again, going back to, to what's on the slide, I think the startup needs to be realistic as to timing and they need to be realistic as to integration. Um, the second point on this slide really is consistent with something I've said already, which is you need to behave commercially, okay? Um, it's really important to look like an adult, okay? To treat your counterparty with the same kind of respect that they would get from a corporate counterparty. You need to have done the work so that you understand market practice in the space that you're in, because otherwise you will seem as kind of uh, naive. Um, you need to focus on, on the business points that make sense. Um, I'll come to this a little bit more when we talk about documentation, but um, there's stuff that's important and there's stuff that you're gonna need to live with that is less important. And so figuring out which is which and focusing on the stuff that's relevant um, is, is significant. And finally, um, as we said before, do trials that make commercial sense. Okay, do trials that result in, that you reasonably expect are gonna result in a, uh, in a contract um, for a couple of reasons. One is, um, uh, A, you have limited resources because you can't do lots of trials. But second of all, a trial that does not lead to a contract is probably a negative. Um, uh, you're gonna need to explain to other corporates why you didn't get a contract out of that trial. You certainly will need to explain to investors why you didn't get a contract out of the trial. So you need to make sure that you are doing trials that are likely, that seem likely, that we are getting a level of commitment that make it likely that, that they'll result in a contract. And then the final point I made in response to the, to the to the, uh, to the question, which is, I don't think you should put all your eggs in one basket. I think you do need to keep uh, different um, uh, balls in the air at the same time. Um, you also need to, I think, know when to quit. Um, uh, there, I've seen circumstances where startups have become so committed to a process and to a counterparty that when it becomes apparent that that's not gonna go anywhere, um, they just don't wanna leave it. Um, you know, they're, they're still getting some kind of um, happy, happy, happy talk from the other side, even though they've come to realize that that happy talk isn't supported by the ability to get stuff done. Um, uh, and at some point, 
you know, in a polite way, you need to you need to reallocate your resource. It doesn't necessarily mean that you you disappear, um, but but you do certainly need to to um, to be focused on, on on resource allocation. Everything we've talked about so far really is not specific to health tech. It's not or med tech. Um, uh, it's general, although I think it's equally applicable in those circumstances. But I think there are some special issues in med tech and health tech. Um, and those are things that which I really would like to talk about at the moment. One is, at least in my experience, there is really a high level, in, and, and this is true in medical devices, it's true in pharma, um, um, certainly, is there's a high level of reluctance of incumbents to enter into areas which are not core subject verticals for them. You know, you may think, well, I've got a product and it's a logical, um, extension um, into a new into a new market because of something that this particular corporate is already doing, but understand that from that standpoint of that health tech med tech company, you know if they've decided that they're interested in kidneys and not hearts, um, it's not likely that um, you know that something that is cardio uh, cardio related is gonna is gonna is gonna interest them. Um, and I'll come back to the, I've gotten the question, but let me come back to it at, uh, in a minute. Um, the second point is you need to anticipate um, what evidence-based support um, and what key opinion leaders that particular corporate or corporates in that segment are likely to need. And this is something that I think starts really early. Um, um, a lot of times I see uh, companies in the med tech space, for example, um, and on the regulatory side, for example, they may be they may be focused on European regulation, but um, they have a U.S. focus and interest a couple of years down the line. Um, but they haven't talked to they haven't talked to anybody about the FDA issues yet. Um, it's not to say that you're going to be filing an FDA application anytime soon, but you need to understand from a very early stage what evidence-based support you're going to need to support a regulatory approval um, in uh, the jurisdictions um, in, uh, that you're interested in, uh, because you should be lining that up from the beginning. That shouldn't be something that you reach, you've spent a couple of years uh, developing studies and all of a sudden you find that you don't have the right cohort, um, you, haven't, you, know, you don't have the right ethnic mix or whatever, and you're gonna have to go out and do another study. And likewise, uh, in terms of key opinion leaders, um, to understand the people who are likely to be important um, to that company in that industry or whatever, um, and to try to line up people like that at the very beginning is, I think, something that, uh, at least in my assessment, for example, by a VIT of different uh, EIT health of different companies I've seen, really separates the companies that know what they're doing and those that don't. Is the ones that have given real thought at the very beginning. Uh, to those issues and have lined up both um, uh, that their trial structures and so forth and their, their, their development of evidence is based on an understanding of what they're going to need down the line, both for the regulator, but also for, for, for corporate counterparties um, uh, and likewise on the key opinion leaders. The health e economics part of this is also critical. Um, um, one of the real problems in the med tech space is that the people who, who pay are not necessarily the same people as the people who get the benefit. Um, and so understanding um, whether there is likely to be a willingness to pay um, is a critical element in assessing um, whether things are gonna fly or not. Um, I was talking to a med tech company who basically told me that they had done an acquisition, um, which basically they put on ice because they realized that they couldn't get a reimbursement code for the activity that, that was contemplated. Um, uh, and therefore, while they thought it was a terrific technology, they weren't prepared to invest in it without actually understanding whether the party who needed to pay for it was going to be willing to pay for it. So the whole question of, at the at quite early stage, understanding how you fit within the reimbursement structure um, in the relevant markets, um, uh, who, uh, who, whether it's uh, a UK type thing where you need to be able to sell somebody like the NHS or whether it's um, medical insurers in the United States or in many uh, European jurisdictions, et cetera, uh, figuring out how you fit economically 
is important not only to the company itself, but also to companies that you would want to collaborate with. Um, and then the final point on this slide really is this whole issue of care pathway and sales channel issues. Um, first of all, you, uh, corporates are not likely, incumbents are not likely to be interested in collaborating with the business apart, as a partnership, for example, where you're hoping that they will sell your product. If what you are doing doesn't actually fit within the way that they sell and the people that they sell to. Um, uh, and so understanding what their established sales pathways are, um, how they sell, how your product is likely to fit in with the things that they sell um, uh, is important. I think the other thing from that standpoint, particularly where you're relying on distributors or other people to sell for you, is to understand also the likely incentives that they have to sell you, okay? Distributors, for example, quite frequently have a large number of products. Um, and so a salesperson is showing up at a hospital or medical clinic or whatever, um, and they're gonna talk to the people in that the relevant contacts about, I don't know, five products. Um, the issue is, is, will there be an incentive for your product to be one of the five? Um, and that in part depends upon what else they may be selling and whether what you have helps them to sell the other stuff. It may have to do with what incentive the salespeople are actually giving to sell different stuff. Um, but uh, don't kind of ignore those issues of, of care pathway, how what you're doing will fit within the relevant care pathway um, and the fact that there are national differences in the way that that works. As I said, these the items on these slides, a lot of them are things which are relevant to you as a company selling on a standalone basis anyway, but they are also relevant in terms of finding um, collaborations that are likely to work for you. Uh, and you should understand that from the standpoint of the corporate, um, they're likely to be looking at, at, at these points when they, when they look at you. Uh, and, my, and the question before was asked about M&A and the same thing is true uh, with, in this context with m and is with collaborations. Um, I have a question from um, Matus, um, uh, which he says, we're, we're now introducing a startup that creates a new way for neurological rehab. Um, they've started MVP at a cl clinic and they're looking to enter international markets later. Um, what to look for when looking for an investor in the medical industry. And I assume when, when you say an investor, I think you, you're talking about um, a, um, a corporate investor uh, uh, as opposed to, as opposed to a, a financial investor or an angel. Um, uh, I think it's a hard question. First of all, I think you need to understand that different, even in the space that you're in, um, that First of all, most corporate investors are not seed investors. Um, so let's start there. Uh, uh, many of them will only come in really after you have a, 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 a commercial product. Um, of those that are prepared to come in um, before you have a commercial product, again, I think you can determine who they are, whether they're coming in through a corporate venture capital um, a unit or whether they're coming in through some kind of direct strategic investment. Um, a lot of it is looking at what they've already invested in uh, and the, the um, stage at which they invest. These are not dissimilar for questions from the questions that you need to ask when you're looking um, at a financial VC, uh, you know, uh, in say the, the health tech med tech space. Because um, there are lots of them around, um, but do they in fact, um, uh, do they in fact invest um, uh, at the stage um, that you're at? And then of course, the whole question is, is are you in the right sub-vertical? I think one of the complexities in the MedTech health tech space, more so than in some other spaces that I, that I give mentorship, is there are so many kind of sub-sub-verticals in this space that you really have to be quite uh, detailed in terms of looking at um, what it is that those companies that may be prepared to invest at early stage um, uh, are actually are actually investing in. Okay, I see we have about seven minutes left, um, and so let me go through a couple of 
final points, which I think are, are important, uh, and also then deal with a couple of questions which have come in. So when do the collaborations work? I think hopefully this is uh, obvious from what we've already talked about, which is um, that we have, it's clear that we've got the same mutual goals, that we have a clear definition of what is success and what's supposed to follow success, that you've got senior commitment and business commitment uh, to engage, that the internal incentives for that work, and that there is a structured process. And that for you means that there is a lead on the corporate side who is supposed to help you navigate um, the challenges on their side, both in dealing with the business and dealing with legal, uh, procurement, uh, IT, um, compliance, all the pieces that may need to, to um, be engaged in order for your project to work. Because if you have to go in directly without that internal lead and negotiate separately with each of them and they each have their own um, objectives and uh, incentives and so forth, um, uh, it will take you forever. You'll need to have, you should have relationships with all of those, but you need somebody to help you um, uh, guide that process. And, and to come back to the question that was asked before, um, how do you, how do you, how can you tell if that person has that ability? Well, because they've done it before, you know, that they're able to say, yes, we, we did a project with X or Y and um, we were able to make it work. And this is what was important to making it work. Um, um, on the corporate side, there needs to be um, a clear understanding that um, all of these pieces are aligned, um, that there really is, this isn't their normal business as usual, um, that they're going to try to move this in a, in a different way because they're dealing with the startup, they're going to try to move quickly, uh, and that there's this real commitment to get it done. And um, again, I think that uh, the best evidence of that is what they've done before. Um, um, uh, and you, you know, you shouldn't be hesitant to say, look, you know, um, we want to be sure that we handle this project in the best way it works for you. Tell us what's worked for you. You know, give us some examples of things that have worked and things that haven't worked in terms of how you've gotten these projects done. Um, a, that will give you an answer to that question. Frank, but frankly, even more importantly, it will give you some intelligence as to whether the corporate actually does have an approach um, to dealing appropriately with startups. Um, uh, the final point is really um, documentation. Um, trial agreements, proof of concept agreements, um, there are a few points that, that I do want to make. One is after the first trial, try to avoid free trials. Um, and if you can avoid a free trial in the first trial, do that as well. Um, in my experience, corporates don't value things they don't pay for. Um, uh, and so while you may think you are providing value or benefit by doing something for free, you actually may be undermining uh, the actual, the serious, you certainly aren't getting a sense as to whether the, the corporate has any serious commitment. That being said, you should understand that somebody um, at a relatively low level may be able to commit 10,000 pounds or 20,000 um, pounds really out of, you know, the equivalent of key money. So you have to not, the, the fact that something is paid doesn't necessarily, uh, at, at a low level, doesn't necessarily indicate a level of commitment. Um, but not getting paid, I think, clearly does uh, indicate a low level of commitment. Um, I really think it's important that the trial agreement have a very clear definition of success. You know, what do you have to show in order for the corporate to consider this as a success? And then the flip side of that is, as I said before, at least a moral commitment as to what's supposed to follow success. Um, if you can get a written commitment that will flip into a contract even better, but at the very least, the corporate should be prepared to, to tell you what their expectation is. Um, through an organization called Tech London Advocates and the Corporate Innovation Group, we've actually published um, a standard form template for uh, a proof of concept agreement. Um, uh, it, it's not the end all and be all, but I think it is something which is useful to look at and to make sure uh, that that you are uh, addressing those points. And if you don't have a form to start with, um, I think it's a useful I think it's a useful starting point. Um, the other side is really a procurement agreement, um, and I think you can get some um, insights about this at a fairly early stage. If 
If a corporate has really had experience in dealing with startups, they are going to have a procurement form, which is different than their standard form. Okay, standard corporate procurement agreement forms, you know, start at 80 pages and go up from there uh, with lots of boilerplate, which frankly don't make any sense in the context of a startup. Okay, to get, uh, to ask for unlimited uh, indemnities from a, from a startup that doesn't have any assets doesn't make any sense. Okay, so if somebody's starting with a form that seems to be requiring that, um, you really have to understand think about whether they've seriously thought about what they were doing here. Um, a, a startup friendly corporate is going to have a short form um, and it's going to address the stuff that makes sense in terms of doing business with a corporate, with a startup, and also take into account that from a corporate standpoint, you know, a contract for, I don't know, under a million pounds or under two million pounds is not very material and therefore the kinds of um, um, protections that they would expect in, in doing a contract with a large counterparty don't really make sense uh, and aren't needed in the context of dealing with the startup. That being said, most of the time you are going to be stuck with uh, effectively the 70 page, 80 page, what I described as doorstop procurement documents from large corporates. Um, and I would suggest in dealing with those, there are a couple things to keep in mind. Um, one is you should um, focus on a limited number of key points. Um, there's going to be a bunch of stuff that you don't like very much, um, uh, but you're going to have to live with. But you should make sure that your KPIs are properly described. And there are a few a key points about IP ownership, for example, that need to ad be addressed. The second point I would suggest is they will tell you to mark up their worst stop and send it back to the legal department. If you can possibly avoid that, don't do that. Um, what you should instead do is go back with a two column presentation um, of their unreasonable provision, probably no more than three pages, probably 10 points on the left and your reasonable alternative on the right. Um, and then try to negotiate those at a business level with your counterparty uh, and then get him or her to effectively uh, get their legal department to revise the standard form in the way that, um, uh, that, that, that you've agreed as a business matter. Um, I think we have one question, assuming that we have time. Um, ah, the, 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 the POC template um, is, um, is available on, uh, uh, through Tech London Advocates. I will send effectively a link to a blog to ALA uh, that includes uh, in turn a link to that template. Um, and you should feel free, free to come back to me if anybody has any questions on that. Thanks guys. I'm more than happy to disseminate that information to you after this webinar. Again, thank you, Bob, for an incredible lecture, for an incre incredible webinar. Some really good questions from the audience. So we'd like to thank you all. Uh, Bob, incredible gems that you dropped in that um, presentation, really good tips. So thank you again. And to everyone here, this recording will be on YouTube at a later date. And thank you again. Be sure to check out the website where we have more webinars upcoming in the series. Thank you all. Okay, and thank you. I appreciate your attending and, and also for to Rosemary and Ella for uh, letting me uh, do this program. Pleasure to have you as always. Have a great day, everybody. Okay, take care. Bye. Goodbye.